we're eight minutes into shooting light and I see what I think is the buck that I didn't get the shot on yesterday come come in like literally there's barely enough light to see through the scope I know there wasn't hardly any light for the camera and you know he comes in and and gets right by that feeder and it's just like all right it's it's go time this this is it we're not we're not gonna play the chance game and and hope something a little bit better comes out and oh you got her dude she's down let's go dude i just shot a deer of a lifetime freaking smoke team one with nature and if you're a believer one with god definitely gets your heart pumping what you are in trouble. Follow Obsession Podcast. Well, welcome back, everybody, to another Fall Obsession Podcast episode driven by our friends over at the Ridge Rock Hunt Company. We'll talk more about those guys at the end of the episode and sponsor segment. I am Sam with Fall Obsession, your podcast host. Glad to be back on here for another Monday morning episode with you guys. Super excited about this episode too because i'm back on here virtually hanging out with a guy that i got to spend a weekend in hunting camp with a little over a month ago um, and that is mr mark zorich welcome back to fall obsession and to the podcast buddy yeah thank you i'm uh i'm super excited you know i'm uh i'm still glowing from the hunt you know we had uh last night we uh made some backstrap from that from the buck that i shot and man those white tails are are delicious they oh, uh they, they they come close to the axis deer in hawaii and but man uh, they're we've been eating and eating and eating that deer so. <laughs> perfect that's awesome man so for for our listeners sake um in case you guys haven't heard or are kind of trying to piece it together together and everything mark um is the lucky guy who won our veteran hunt giveaway that we hosted a whitetail deer hunt down here in Texas, um, beginning of December for a weekend. Um, and we have a big shout out to pro staffer Waylon Langford, um, for his contribution with actually providing the place for Mark to go hunting and everything. But, um, all as I say, a lot of what we're going to talk about here is in reference to that trip and Mark coming down here and spending a weekend in camp with, uh, Waylon and myself and, Obviously, as he already alluded to, got some venison to take back home to California with him there. So, um, just a little bit. <laughs> just a little bit, yeah. I'm sure we'll talk. We'll make sure that we hit that too, as far as uh, what all was involved with getting that, getting that back too, because that was that was interesting. But we'll we'll get yeah. to that. And that's actually good knowledge for people that want to hunt out of state too. Yes, absolutely, 100. percent Well, man, I'm to kind of. To kind of lead into it, um, and I know I know you and I and, and Waylon, we had these conversations in camp and everything. We're kind of going back and reflecting a little bit here today. Um, but obviously, we probably have some people listening to this podcast, too, that aren't familiar with the story or anything like that. So let's start at the beginning. Let's talk about what your thoughts were coming down to Texas and kind of how those played out, expectations versus reality type thing. Yeah. So, you know, I applied, what was it? probably, I think it was the second week of December. I saw the, the giveaway pop up on my Facebook feed and, um, you know, one of the, I guess, perks of being a veteran is there's a lot of organizations out there that, that do veteran type hunts, um, or giveaways and stuff like that. So while I have applied for many of them, this was the first one that I applied for and I won. And it was, a uh, like, you know, that call that you gave me that afternoon, I was just like elated, you know, I was like, really, you guys chose me of all people. So, you know, I don't know if I necessarily went out with, with any expectations. Um, I've never hunted whitetail before. I've never hunted like in ground blinds or anything like that before. Um, so I kind of went into it with a, with an open mind, you know, I didn't want to either set myself up for disappointment but with that you know if we had success i wanted to enjoy that success as much as i could um so you know i went in with like a real open mind not expecting anything um and you know the whole experience was far exceeded any 
any expectations that I, I did have, you know, it was, it was, uh, it was top notch from, from pickup to, uh, when you dropped me off the airport. Happy to hear it, man. So you, you mentioned never have, having never hunted ground blinds before or anything like that. I know you're from California and we'll talk more here in a little bit about kind of your hunting experience up there and everything. But I know that first day and I'll, I'll say it from, and I, I can speak for Waylon as well from the, the side of the hunt host, you know, we get out there and you know, as good as I do that it's warmer temps. The wind is just absolutely tearing it up out there. I was nervous that first afternoon because I mean, we want to be good hosts. We want to, you know, give you a good experience and everything when you come down here and we roll into camp that first, first day that Friday afternoon. And the wind is just absolutely ripping a new one out there on the, in the Texas panhandle. And, uh, yeah, I, I was a little skeptical, but we got in the ground blind. What, what were your thoughts when we first, uh, first got down there and got in that blind? Um, I was like, well, here we go. You know, it's, uh, I only know whitetail hunting from like TV shows, you know, and, you know, so I, there, there's, there's two, I guess, like perceptions that I, I went out there with is one man, this could be really, really boring. You know, it's coming from the style of hunting that, that I've come accustomed to hunting in California and everything. It's we're on the move constantly. So I'm like, well, how's this going to be? And then two, like you said, the, the weather, I wasn't sure about the, the temperature wise, how the deer were going to react. Cause I don't know the environment, but, um, I know at least out here when it gets real windy like that. And I think what that first day was probably like 30 to 40 mile an hour gusts yeah. from what I could feel. I was like, I do know deer lay down in, in wind like that. And, uh, but you know what we saw that I think we had a doe pop out at like the first five minutes. Yeah. That was absolutely a hog of a doe. Um, so I think, all of that went away right then and there, you know, it was just like, all right, we're going to, we're going to see deer. And, uh, you know, I don't think I'm going to be bored and I think we're going to, we're going to have some opportunity here. Absolutely. Yeah. I was, I was very pleased to have that first one pop out right away. I, I was probably just as surprised as you were to, to see her that quick and everything. Cause it's still at the same time, it's early in the afternoon also, but, um, Waylon had a, a really good spot. Um, as far as where he'd set his blind and everything. And just, I mean, the, the environment and at least coming from a Texas guy is not what we typically, or what I've typically hunted or anything like that. I know Waylon talked to you about, you know, his, his experience going out there when he first got on the place and not thinking there was any deer there just cause how flat and open it is. But man, the deer are there. They, they hug those Creek beds, those tree lines and everything. And he hunts, he's hunting the edges of them is what he's doing. And, and it paid off for us that weekend for sure. So. Yeah, definitely. And, you know, there's quite a bit more topography out there than what it leads on to be, you know, after we got the dough, you know, and we kind of had to go down in that Creek area to recover. Like you really see the, that there is a lot of terrain in there. There's a lot of cover and there's a lot of way for those deers to use that as like, you know, kind of a, a deer highway almost, and then pop out when they need to pop out. And it was a, it was cool to see that, you know, it wasn't just some giant open, open field. There yeah. was a, there was quite a bit of habitat in there and they were using that habitat very, very well. Yeah, exactly. So talking about that doe hunt in particular, because Waylon, Waylon threw that in there for you too, and let you I mean, it was originally, you know, you were coming down there for a whitetail buck. That was the goal. But, I mean, the the does are everywhere out there. And he was – he threw one of those your way and gave you the opportunity to do, take a doe the first morning, so Saturday morning. And uh, that was – she ran farther than we thought and ended up crossing a creek. Um, that was uh, an interesting experience, I think, for everybody, uh, getting that thing back across the creek. And I, I don't know if I uh, told y'all in camp or anything, but, you know, the, the whole weekend and everything, I'm, I'm texting our, our fall obsession admins and stuff, you know, keeping them up to date on how things are going. And everybody's excited, excited to have you out there. And then um, <laughs> we get that, I tell them the story briefly of 
getting that having to get that dough back across the creek because I'm the only one wearing tall boots, so I'm the one that goes over there and everything. And their immediate reaction is, "Man, that's gonna look really good in the video, or that's gonna be cool to show in the video." I'm like, "Hey guys, when you send the cameraman across the creek to get your deer, you normally don't get it on film." <laughs> yeah, you know that was uh, you know, I'll I'll admit it. I got I got a little bit of buck fever, you know, um, for the audience that hasn't seen the video or doesn't know my background. Um, I'm a, I'm a police sniper. I'm a sniper instructor. And then I have a business where I teach people how to shoot bolt, bolt rifles and at very, very long distances. But, you know, I got with a little bit of buck fever and, um, how cold it was, you know, the last time I had shot that rifle and zeroed that rifle, was at my house before I took a trip to go hunt axis deer in Hawaii. So my rifle was zeroed for temperatures that were almost a hundred degrees. Um, and me, it was just an error on my part. And it's something I teach in my classes all the time at how much weather affects flight paths, especially real cold weather, um, between how the powder burns in the cartridge and then how the bolt actually travels through that thick, dense, cold air. You know, it wasn't the most ideal shot. Um, and hey, I, I, I'll I'll admit that all the time. You know, we can't always make perfect shots. And um, luckily, we were we were able to tromp through some of that terrain. And and you were actually able to find that that doe bedded down. And man, she chose the worst spot ever. <laughs> she she chose a. She chose an island in the middle of a creek, and I think the silt in that creek, if you had put all your weight into it, probably would have gone up to your knee. Yeah. Um. <laughs> it, it was it was straight straight nasty, and it, it smelled bad. And, and and you look at, and I made a comment to Waylon that weekend too. You look at all these deer, and and with whitetail, you know, you typically see a a, a lighter or a, a tan colored, you know, leg from the bottom down on these deer. Well, all these deer are walking around with these dark brown or black legs from the knee down and at first glance i was trying to figure it out like what's the deal is that just a weird looking deer and they all had it and that's exactly why because they cross those creeks and they're so freaking deep like that that it's mm -hmm. just it just it swallows them up what what we ended up doing for so our listeners know we ended up um i found a like an old dried pretty lightweight uh log just from a down tree threw it across the creek to make a quote unquote bridge and kind of shimmied my way back across there, scooting the, the doe. And she's a big doe on top of that. So we're scooting her with them. And I get, I get all the way to the end. And I think I probably had one more scoot, one more step left. And I was losing my balance at that point. And I think I looked at Waylon and I was like, Hey, grab the deer. And Waylon reached out and grabbed her foot. And I think you grabbed me at that point and pulled me in. <laughs> yeah. But that could have been a lot, lot worse than it ended. But we got her, we got her over and everything. But yeah, there's, there's so many places back in there that are like that. That, like looking at these open fields, looking at just acres and acres and acres of farmland, you wouldn't think that these deer have an environment like that out there to, to hide in and live in. So it's pretty, mm -hmm. pretty crazy. You also didn't tell them that you found out about the hole in your boot on that last step. Yeah, I, I did find <laughs> out that I had a hole in my right boot. And for the record, I have since gotten new hunting boots so we're we're all squared away for if and when that has to happen again so yeah that was a uh, man you know that was a uh, that was an, it, it definitely an interesting experience because then we had to hike that doe out and i mean i think that doe probably weighed like 150 160 pounds yeah we had to hike that doe out through a bunch of scrub brush out what what are those like uh little mesquite, manzanita that, little mesquite trees little mesquite, and stuff yeah yeah, through all this mesquite, through all these dry creek beds for about 100 yards and then get this thing under a fence so we could get it to the truck and, and take it back. And, man, I wish I had made a better shot. But <laughs> it was – it was uh, I'm glad we recovered her. And, uh, yeah, she was a, a heifer of a, of a doe. Absolutely. Yeah, we, we got her knocked down too, and I know the mindset – uh, at the beginning of that day also was, you know, obviously, you know, don't want to seem like we're hunting horns, but it's a buck hunt, you know, that, mm -hmm. that's, that's, that's why you're there. And 
all the bucks out there are busted up, and there's one in particular that if he hadn't have broken off his entire right side, he he probably would have been the the one that got the lucky ticket at the end of the end of the week. Mm-hmm. But um, you know, kind of holding out, hoping for a good buck like that. And I remember I remember asking that more in the blind. You you know, hey, if you want to take a doe, you can take a doe. And now I'm gonna hold out for a buck and. About nine thirty rolls around and you're like, I'm cold. I'm gonna shoot a doe now. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, the, someone forgot the the blind heater that morning. So uh, yeah, yeah, I think uh, I think we were I think we were both cold. I did it for both of us, but <laughs> we did we did have that we did have that one buck this morning that was, I think from what I remember, he was pretty similar to the buck I ended up taking. But with with my experiences through shooting and police work and, and competition shooting. I just felt like if I had taken that shot, I, I was almost a hundred percent sure that I was going to hit barbed wire. So, I mean, what we watched that one buck 25, 30 minutes that morning, I think before, yeah. before that doe came before, you know, we kind of deemed that it was too late, I guess. Right. And I decided like, Hey, let's go shoot that, that doe. But, yeah, I was there to shoot a buck, you know, and we definitely saw a lot of bucks, you know, it was, it was cool. And that was like one of the highlights, you know, it was like every hour you're like, Hey, there's a buck over there. Or, hey, I see a buck over here. And, you know, they weren't all necessarily shooters, but you know, it's cool to see something with antlers on it, trotting down at 200, 300, 400 yards away and watching him come into the feeder or, Across the creek in that that one spot where everything was yeah yeah for sure definitely uh definitely had plenty of deer to, to look at and keep us entertained throughout the throughout the hunts for sure no doubt about that mm-hmm. and you know even though like we spent a we spent a lot of time in that blind having that the amount of animals come through you know even if it wasn't a buck you know having group of does come in you know it kept it interesting you know you weren't just sitting there glassing at nothing for hours at a time you know we can almost i mean i would say we saw at least a new deer or a deer coming in you know every 25 to 30 minutes which kept it interesting it kept us awake and and kept me hopeful and excited yeah absolutely well man let's uh let's fast forward to the last morning when what it all boiled down to in the end yeah you know uh down to the wire and you know out here when hunts get down to the wire it means you ain't getting anything (laughs) but you know with with the amount of deer we had we had seen the the first afternoon and then the full the first our full day of hunting on saturday you know I, i i went into that morning very very excited i knew we were going to get something you know i and i didn't think we were going to settle on anything that was like you know a yearling or anything like that you know i knew something good was going to come but yeah you know we're we're eight minutes into shooting light and i see what i think is the buck that i didn't get the shot on yesterday come come in like literally there's barely enough light to see through the scope i know there wasn't hardly any light for the camera and you know, he comes in and and gets right by that feeder and it's just like, all right, it's, it's go time. This, this is it. We're not, we're not going to play the chance game and and hope something a little bit better comes out. And, you know, I knew, I knew right away, I told you that, Hey, we're going to shoot this buck, you know, and you're like, okay, let's, let's do it. You know, he's like, you're like, you told me the light's not great, but we're not going to worry about that. We're going to worry about getting a deer on the ground. Yeah. So, you know, uh, I'd learned my lesson the day before on, on where my rifle needed to be. So I put a little bit of, of adjustment into it. So that mistake wasn't going to happen with a low, low shot again. And, uh, you know, he gave me a perfect broadside shot at like, I think we were at like 130 or so yards. And as soon as the shot cracked off, like I knew, I knew it was right behind the shoulder and the vitals and, you know, I didn't get right back on him just how I was set up in the blind, but, but you're like, he's down. And I was like, where? I don't see him. So I thought he took off again. You know, I thought he went right back behind him because there was that game trail behind him. 
and uh you're like no he's down i saw him go down i saw him go down and uh you know he ended up dropping 25 30 yards from from where we shot so it was really good shot placement and uh you know it, it was the buck i wanted you know it was uh again not going in with any expectations you know i i didn't think we were going to shoot one of these trophy inbred white tails that you see on these high fence ranches i know we were we were out there to shoot a wild white tail and I couldn't have been happier with, with the deer we got, you know, so it was awesome, awesome morning. And the fact that we were eight minutes into shooting light, you know, took all that stress off and it was just a, a great way to, to cap a, an awesome weekend. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. That was definitely a mindset going in is that whatever's going to happen at a buck that is going to be worthy of putting a tag on, it's going to happen sooner rather than later because just the behavior that we had seen, you know, with the, the morning before was any, any bucks that showed any potential were moving early and the later it got, yeah, you still had does and maybe a young buck or two in front of you, but the later it got, obviously the, and I know that this is kind of a, a standard thing that a lot of people probably observe in their local hunting areas, but the later it got, you know, the, the more your chances kind of were withering away. So kind of went into it with the mentality of as soon as we get an opportunity, we need to capitalize. And man, you did just that. It worked out good. It it did work out good. And, you know, I didn't feel like, I didn't feel like I cheated myself by shooting that buck. I didn't feel like we left anything out there. You know, the buck that we saw the day before was pretty much identical. He was, had a little bit of broke. He had a one time that was broken off and, you know, we didn't see anything that was like, man, I should have shot that one. Yeah. You know, that buck was on par with the biggest deer that we saw out there that weekend, besides that absolute trophy that ran across the road when we were going out <laughs> that one afternoon. But you know, that, you know, he, you know, I couldn't have been happier with, with what we shot. And like, you know, you, I, I hope you can still hear it. You know, my, my happiness from remembering that I feel like right now is the same happiness I felt right then and there. You know, so awesome. it was a, it was just, you know, it was, it was a great way to like end the hunt. You know, it was, we're down to the wire, big old body buck. That was a fighter comes on out. And, you know, that was the way I think you want to hunt to end. You know, if this was, this was like a television TV show, you know, we hit the climax of the hunt right at the perfect time. You yeah. know, we didn't, we didn't shoot the a buck on the first day. And then like, what are we going to do for the rest of the, the weekend? You know, we, it used our time well yeah absolutely man yeah it, it could not have gone any more perfect for sure so one thing that's not in any of the videos and and before i forget i haven't even mentioned it but um we do have a video um kind of centered around mark and just you know why this hunt was was special to him and everything on our youtube channel um it's the first installment of our my obsession series but it's it's this hunt is is the experience that we were able to document with him so a lot of what we're talking about here um is is shown throughout that that short video but one thing that's not in the video is getting that meat back to california and i know i asked you before you even came at, came down there you know what your intentions were for the meat and you were pretty pretty confident that you were bringing it back and said that you were bringing cooler bags and stuff and i just all right he's he's got it figured out he he seems to know what he's doing because i i really uh i really didn't know what you had planned but again <laughs> you seem pretty confident so i was going to take your word for it and uh so i'll, I'll let you share with everybody kind of kind of what your system is for for traveling and, and flying on an airplane with with wild game meat fresh out of the field yeah. Yeah, I know. I, I I I don't think Waylon believed what I was gonna do until we left. But <laughs> so I've been I've been lucky enough and fortunate enough to hunt access deer twice in Hawaii, and you know baggage to and from Hawaii is really really expensive because you know you have all of your regular luggage you have a rifle you're bringing out there which is another bag and then you know you want to get meat home well. How do you get meat home, especially when the, the, the plane ride is going to be six plus hours 
it's a super warm environment and uh you know shipping it is going to cost you hundreds and hundreds of dollars to overnight or two day something so i did a ton of research before my first axis hunt about what you can and can't bring onto airplanes as carry-on bags and weight limits and all of this stuff so um on both my axis hunts i have taken like yeti cooler bags like the soft cooler bags i have knockoffs because i can't afford the yeti stuff but <laughs> i've taken yeti soft cooler bags i think they're like the 33 quart cooler bags and i've been able to freeze the meat and in quarters and i bring the meat on as a carry-on <laughs> um <laughs> I know it's hard to believe and you know people are like really you just bring like hundreds of pounds of meat on as carry-ons and yes that that, <laughs> that is that is how I get that is how I have got the meat home twice from from Hawaii and then on on this hunt um I did check one of our bags in because I had three of these coolers um with like 50 60 pounds of meat in each of them but I'm fine with paying extra baggage fee on one paying extra baggage three on three would have been like 300, 400 bucks. But yeah. So for this hunt, I didn't, I wasn't able to freeze it, but we were able to get the meat into um, quartered out skinned. And then I used non-scented trash bags um, and you do a really good wrap with the non-scented trash bags. And then you can fold them over and almost double wrap them. And we were able to get it the, uh, the dough on ice was almost completely frozen and then the buck got cold enough. And then with the dough meat, it was, it was plenty cold in them. Wrap them in the trash bags. And then we were able to get like either I got, I think we got three shoulders in one. I know we got two quarters in the back straps in another. And then we got all the other meat in the last one. Um, so yeah, it, you get a little bit of weird looks going through TSA. I know I got flagged on that one. Oh, you did? On that yes. Yeah, so I, I had to go do the special check because the guy thought I was bringing home. He thought there was for he thought there was a dead dog in it. <laughs> I was like, really? You think I'm going to bring a, like, a dead dog through this? But, um, yeah, he came over and did the check and just made sure it wasn't like human or uh domestic animal and i told him what it was and showed him my hunt license and yeah <laughs> 100 pounds of meat carried on man that so i know i was having a hard time wrapping my mind around i know waylon waylon shared the same the same feeling but i mean we we're we we're both just going with it you know it's like he's he's done it before and i know you mentioned you know it's probably a more common thing in some place like hawaii where everybody flies in and out you know opposed to opposed to Texas, but so for, for our listeners who don't know the, you know, like Mark said, the dough was already pretty cold because we had, we put these deer, we quartered them after we, after he killed them. And then we just put them in ice chests and it was, ice chests just stayed in my, in my pickup, but it was cold enough outside at, at night and even during the day that, you know, the, the ice held and the meat got really cold. But with the buck, obviously he killed the buck the same day that he was leaving so it's a th roughly a three hour drive from the camp house to the airport. So we left the buck, we left both of them on ice all the way to the airport. And then Mark and I are standing there in the airport parking garage, packing meat into these Yeti cooler bags, people driving by and walking around and everything. <laughs> I wasn't even paying attention to see if we were getting any looks or not, but, um, yeah, I can check that off my list as something I've never done at DFW airport before. So, mm -hmm. <laughs> but it's, it's good knowledge, you know, it's especially for, for people to hunt out of state, you know, it's, it'd be, it's easy to do a deer and antelope. You're probably not going to do it with an elk or anything like that, but you know, it's uh, for people that have to hunt on a budget and aren't these people that can afford tens of thousand dollar hunts with the, the host shipping your meat back for you and coolers and everything. It's a, it's just a good little snippet to have because it makes hunting more accessible to to everyone and it makes it so you can hunt and then you don't have to waste the meat you know obviously i would have if, if we were in california i would have taken every scrap of meat off those deer that i could but that's not quite a reality in, in these situations but we took 
as much as I possibly could, you know, eat, I think I brought home close to 150 pounds of meat from those two. We were right under it. So we loaded those bags as full as I could possibly get them. And I will enjoy every morsel of those. <laughs> well, man, it was, it was an awesome trip. I, I know I, I speak for Waylon too, that, you know, we were super, super excited to have you come down here and join us. And it was, uh, it, it was just as rewarding for us to be able to, to do what we could to make that possible for you. So really, really glad that you got to make the trip down and, and join us for a weekend in Texas. No, it was, uh, it was awesome. And like, you know, like I still can't convey like how, how grateful I am to both you and to Waylon for, for that property. You know, I, I told Waylon six times that weekend, like, dude, this property is absolutely amazing. Like, I can't believe you just let some stranger come out here and, and hunt it because, you know, that, and that takes a lot of trust, you know, it takes a lot of trust for one, that they're going to be competent with, with their, their rifle and they're going to know what to do when the animal does come and you're not going to just sit in here taking pop shots at deer from whatever yardage we were at. And, you know, and you know, I, I'm, I'm glad that he installed that trust in me so quick. You know, he'd never talked to me and never met me or anything. And, uh, it was such a, a fun weekend, you know, you're like, well, don't expect much from the camp house or whatever. And, you know, it was like a full on, it was a super cool little hunt house and everything, you know, it's nothing crazy fancy or anything like that, but you know, he has some cool mounts in there. It gave us a, a roof over our head. It was warm every night and it was close to the hunting grounds. You know, it was, a it, it, it was, it was, again, it was, it was way more than I could have ever expected from the whole experience. So you know, I, I'm hoping, like I told you and I told Waylon, like, I hope that you guys can give this opportunity to another veteran. And I hope that veteran is as grateful for the experience as I am, because it was, it seriously, it made my hunting season. Awesome. We appreciate it, man. And, and thank you very much. And yes, absolutely. We hope that the future definitely holds some, some similar opportunities for others, for sure. That's something that we, we for sure want to be a part of and giving back to to you guys who served our country and, and still serving like you are now as a first responder and everything. So very much appreciative. On that note, though, before we hang up, I'm going to shift gears a little bit to, to you up there because um, you coming down here and hunting in Texas with us is is not all that there is to you by any means. <laughs> so um, first off, uh, I'll, I'll let you kind of talk about maybe some of your your experiences up there hunting because you you've been hunting for several years up there in, in California and California is not normally a uh for lack of a better term a, a destination state for a lot of people when it comes to hunting it's not something you know the first place that comes to mind so tell us a little bit about your neck of the woods and what your hunting experience has has been like up there over the years so I had love. I I'm an avid avid hunter from turkey, ducks, deer, elk, anything I can hunt and eat. I love to hunt, but California is one of the most frustrating states to hunt deer in that you could imagine. Um, it is a ton of work if you don't have private property to hunt, um, and our deer here are nothing like are not they're they're pretty much like dogs with antlers they're 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 pretty small um we have a Colombian blacktail on the western portion of the state and then on the eastern portion in the Sierra Nevadas we have hybrids of mule deer and blacktail and then on the eastern slope itself we have full bred mule deer um so I hunt in a zone typically called B zone it's uh in the Mendocino National Forest and we hunt anywhere in the elevation between like 64 to 8,400 feet. And on the area that I hunt in, typically, I have like a spot that has been very productive for California standards. Um, you know, we can go in there with four tags and generally we'll fill two to two to four of them, which is for that zone. That zone has a 15 percent success rate average. Wow. And that's high. That's the average zone. That's not a premium hunt in California. It has closer to like a three to 5% success rate. 
So we go in and everything's on our back. Um, our base camp is about five miles from the truck and it is in like, ter like real steep terrain. Like you think of a true Western hunter, um, like you are hiking on like very narrow trails up and down the sides of mountains. Um, the area that the deer are typically in, you're side hilling on shale to get to the areas for the deer. Um, and then if and when you are successful, you're hiking that deer on your back with all your gear out. So it's, it's very different. Um, this coming up season, I will be lucky enough to pull one of our premium zones on the Eastern slope. Um, I could have pulled the tag this year, but due to a family vacation and some other stuff, I wasn't, I didn't want to go up there and only have a, a weekend hunt it. I want to give myself the full 10 days to go up there, but um, those zones are called X zone for us. And it takes anywhere from four and a half to like 12 to 15 years for the real high end ones to be able to pull them. So we do a, a true preference point system. So every year that you don't draw that tag, you get a point added to it. And the good thing about the deer zones is there's not a lot of point creep on them. So generally if you want said zone, if it's six points this year, it'll be six points next year. Now for our elk and antelope, that's a little bit different. It's there's a lot of point creep with our elk and antelope and it's like a once in a lifetime tag, unfortunately for how stable our elk herds are here. Um, so hopefully that'll change, but it's, it's a very different style of hunting and, and, like I said, like I told you out there, and I think I mentioned it in the video, there's, it's not better or worse than what you guys do. You know, there's, there's a lot of fun in being way out in the back country on your own, but there's also a tremendous amount of frustration, hopelessness, disappointment <laughs> when, you know, you, you've been out there for five days and you've seen three bucks and the black tail out here are, are, we call them the gray ghosts of the forest. You know, they are, incredibly incredibly intuitive to their surroundings you know we have a lot of mountain lions and a lot of bears where the deer live so these things have noses on them like you wouldn't believe and they have ears and eyes that are insane you know if if they see you they're gone and you will never see that buck again and, and it's uh it's hard so i think that was why i had such a fun time going out with you guys you know it's not necessarily an easier hunt with you guys because you have to have a lot of patience like if you want something decent or you have to be able to sit out there in 40 mile an hour winds or 20 degree mornings you know and that's miserable on its own but um it's fun to be able to see all the deer and being like a part of their habitat versus like as soon as you become a part of the habitat out here the deer never come back but it's fun yeah california is different um i'm fortunate enough i live on eight acres um and all the properties around mine are between five to 20 acres so i have some pretty good habitat for deer on my property and i've i've been able to take a, the nicest buck i'll ever take in california on my property a couple years ago and awesome. um so i hunt archery on my property and then uh hunt turkeys so turkey season's coming up in about a month and a half here and um we're always loaded with turkey and everything and then uh if you want to shoot ground squirrels we got plenty, plenty of those here too yeah different different worlds for sure but it, it doesn't matter where you go or what you're hunting it it's hard to say one is extremely easier than another because like you say they they all come with their own challenges for sure so yeah and you know it's like I know that there's Western hunters that look down on, on said style of hunting or whatever, or that's just, you're just shooting fish in a barrel. And that's like, that's completely not true whatsoever. It's just, it's just a different style and, and there's nothing wrong with either one, you know, like I would love like listening to Waylon talk all weekend, you know, listening to him talk about his record deer and the deer that he sees on the property and like, you know, watching you with your Texas dirt series and all that, like, like that, how, how could you not have fun with that? You know, like, exactly. yeah. you know, it, it, you, you get, you, you get in tune with what these deer are doing and 
you know, like with you guys being able to manage habitat and like affect how these deer produce and affect antler size and, you know, like really hone in on what you want like that's awesome like i wish i could do that here like that's not possible in california and it won't ever be possible here you know like i told you like if the if it has antlers on it and it has a a, a fork on it i'm gonna shoot it i'm not passing on a buck in california I, I i will say with a caveat to that i will pass on bucks in x zone because the deer population up there is quite a bit healthier where you are seeing multiple bucks a day, but that's also why it takes six, seven, eight years to pull these tags. But yeah, you know, it, it's, it's two different worlds, but it's, it's hunting, yeah. you know, you don't have to go through this grueling agonizing process to have success and be, and have it be fun. So it, it was a cool experience. And I know I, I would like you guys to come out here and I'll, I'll take you up into the wilderness one year and, and, you know, and you guys can, have a different style of hunting yeah that's awesome man for sure well real quick also outside of hunting and you alluded to it earlier on toward the beginning but um you're you're a sheriff's deputy now former military sheriff's deputy mm -hmm. now you're a sniper and you you run your own shooting school or shooting academy tell us a little bit about that yeah so um last year or no, it was not last year. It was two and a half years ago. I got certified through the state of California to be a sniper instructor. And so I've always done the bolt guns and the long range shooting through work and through the police and tactical aspect of it. But I got really into like shooting competition shooting. It's called the NRL, the national rifle series or PRS or the precision rifle series. Um, but there's like this huge gateway into these two sports, you know, it's long range shooting has been so overly complicated with different techniques and scopes and ballistic data. And I was like, it doesn't have to be that hard. You know, if I can teach a cop to do this, I can teach a civilian to do it because <laughs> cops are not smart, you know, things need to be black and white and we just need to be able to do it. So, you know, I saw kind of a, a little niche on like an opportunity so last spring on a couple of the facebook hunting forums i posted a little bit about me and i said hey i'd like to start teaching this stuff no social media on my end as far as business pages go and my first class sold out 12 shooters in like a matter of like two days wow i'm like whoa so I posted another one again, no social media, not doing anything just on word of mouth. That one sold out in like two days. So I was like, okay, let's post another one. Well, I ended up posting another two that summer. All of them sold out. I was like, man, I think there's something here. Um, and they were, they're such a fun experience. You know, I have access to a private range where we have steel hung out to from 200 yards all the way up to 1350 yards. So I have a really good range to teach people on and show them how ballistics work, what happens at X amount of distance to these bullets and, and really hone in on the fundamentals of what long rifles can do, you know, without complicating it. Right. Um, and my methodology and my system has worked super, super well. Um, so, I've finally made social media pages and it's kind of taken off. Um, I've posted my first five classes for this year, which my first one's not even until April and all five of the, my first classes until July are sold out within weeks. Wow. Um, and then I plan to have probably another two or three, depending on my competition schedule at the end of summer. But, yeah, it's super fun. It's my biggest passion in life. I, uh, that's what I was doing before this. I have my little, my little 22 trainer gun right here that I was out <laughs> at on my buddy's property, um, teaching him cause he's going to shoot his first competition season with me this summer. Um, so teaching him and then also getting my skills back. Um, you know, it's a shooting's a perishable skill and if you don't train at it, no matter how good you are, you're going to start sucking at it at some point. Yep. So, 
yeah, if you guys are interested in long range shooting and I know the majority of your audience isn't on the West coast, but, um, post a lot of how to's and instructional stuff. And if you wanted to shoot me a message like, Hey, I'm interested in the scope or, Hey, this is what's going on with my gun. Um, my Facebook page is West coast long range. And then, uh, my Instagram page is West coast underscore long range. And yeah, I'm happy to help out if, if you guys can make it out to a class, I'd love to have fall session out there for a class, you know, yeah. come out and uh, we have a lot of fun, you know, everything's included in my classes and I just try and take care of the shooters in the least stressful environment that they can be in so they can learn what this great sport has to offer. Absolutely. For sure, man. That's awesome. And you, I mean, you're already sold out. You got no problem growing or, or, or getting where you need to be right now, but best of luck to you as, as you continue to pursue that. And, and yeah, it's just, it, it's an awesome thing that you're doing there for sure. So happy to yeah, happy that it's going well for you. Yeah. And it's, it's super fun. And, you know, I'm, it's kind of like a new challenge, you know, like I'm having to figure out like the social media stuff and, and all that, like, I'm sure you have uh, like going through, like, how do, how do I make the, how do I get people more engaged or how do I get a broader audience or how do I get more follows or, and then like, we, I know me and you talked about it a little bit too, like on the content creator aspect of it. Like I told you, like, I'm not a creative person. Like I'm not good at, at visual arts or anything like that, but having to start learning that and start thinking about like, Hey, I, I need to make a post about this, but I need the picture to look good. Or I want to make a video about this. And I'm all in like the, the very baby phase of it. So, it's, <laughs> you know, it was cool to go out on this hunt to bring it full circle and watch a content creator and watch how you work and, and, and your ideas and how to run these interviews and, and all that stuff. So, yeah, it's uh, it's fun. It's a good experience, and it's something I love. You know, hopefully, I don't have to be a cop in like five years, and I can just go teach people how to shoot. You're you're well on your way to it for sure. You got a good a good foundation laid to to do something like that eventually for sure. So yeah. Well, man, I appreciate you coming on our podcast as our guest for this week, and uh, again, reflecting on on a trip that. I know I'll not soon forget. I'm sure you won't either. It's a, a real, really awesome time again that we, we got to share camp together. I hope it's not the, not the only time we, we get to share camp. Um, time will tell, but for sure, as I've said many times, it was super awesome having you down here in Texas and appreciate you coming down. Appreciate you joining us for that. And, and again, join us for this podcast has been fun. Definitely. And yeah, same. I think we'll share a camp somewhere. You guys either need to come out to the West Coast or we'll go on an elk hunt or something out in Montana or Wyoming one of these days and do a little backcountry. Heck but, yeah. Yeah. Super grateful to you and to Waylon. And, you know, I've, I, I, I've said it 20 times on here. I said it 20 <laughs> times but on my weekend out there with you guys. Like, just amazing. All around, great experience. Super fun. And, you know, I won't forget it. It's like, it, it, it'll probably it's probably one of the most memorable hunts i've ever been on you know and not because we took a trophy or, or anything like that just because of how giving you guys were and then how awesome you and Waylon were on the hunt and, and the whole experience in general so it was uh yeah it'll be sad i'll be sad when i finish these deer every time <laughs> i eat one of these deer it's, i meet my memories yeah <laughs> Well, to our listeners, we appreciate you guys tuning in this week um, to another Fall Obsession podcast episode. If you guys have not already, um, hit that follow and subscribe button on whatever podcast platform you guys are listening on. We are on all major podcast apps, as well as our YouTube channel and our website, fallobsession.com. Head on over to that YouTube channel if you haven't already and subscribe to that. We're putting out um, a lot of different videos right now. Got some more stuff in the works coming. And again, if you have not seen Mark's video, um, with the first installment of that My Obsession series talking where he recaps and we actually show parts of this hunt that we've talked about here today. Um, head on over to our YouTube and, and see that. It's, uh, it's up there ready for you guys to find. FallObsession.com, that is our hub. That's our website. That's where you guys can go to find all of our content, um, video series, educational articles, gear reviews, um, 
podcast, obviously. We got it all on there for you guys. We're also working right now with uh, our staffers across the country to come up with some more regional-specific content uh, to put on there, and we're working on that those pages as we speak. So be sure you guys go check that out. We also got our apparel on there, um, pick up some Fall Obsession merchandise. Been a little light on there here lately with uh, the shortages and stuff, but finally got some stuff uh, at our vendor about to roll back in. So head on over there, and we do offer uh, military and first responder discounts. Um, if you fit into either one of those groups, be sure you fill out the form. That way we can uh, hook you guys up. Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, again, that YouTube. Go follow us on all of the social media platforms we post daily. Um, and another thing that we are working on right now, um, this podcast is going to be episode number 90. So we're coming up on that 100 number for our podcast episodes. Um, and we're trying to do something a little bit different for episode 100. It's going to be the first time that all four of our fall obsession administrators get on here and do a, a virtual podcast together. And we want to be able to answer y'all's questions or talk about anything that you guys are just wanting to know more about whatever it might be if you have something you want to share and want us to cover in episode 100 go to fallobsession.com slash podcast fill out the form on there and we'll be sure that we hit it in the upcoming episode 100 do it sooner rather than later because these next 10 weeks will fly by before you know it so finally our sponsor segment ridge rock hunt company i'm rocking the hat Derek and Lacey over in uh, Mississippi, they book hunts um, with vetted outfitters across the entire North America um, and, and outside the United States as well. They're, uh, they're good friends of ours. We've enjoyed getting to know them and uh, cultivating that relationship over the past couple of years. And they're, uh, they're good people, and they'll, they'll steer you straight and get you hooked up with whatever you're looking for, whatever kind of hunt it might be. So... Head on over, check them out on social media and their website. Again, it's Ridge Rock Hunt Company. Mark, thanks again, buddy. It's been awesome yeah, talking thanks. to you, catching up. Thank you. It was, uh, yeah, it's good to relive the memories. Absolutely. All right, guys, thank you all for listening, and we will catch you guys again next week for another Fall Obsession podcast episode.